Let's open our Bibles to Zechariah chapter 4. And let me read these verses to you. Now the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me as a man who is wakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? So I said, I am looking and there's a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other on its left. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me saying, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. So he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord, Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain. And he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel laid the foundations of this temple, and his hand shall also finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you, for who has despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hands of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord, which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your word. Thank you for these verses that are challenging and are encouraging. And and I pray that you would uh, teach us this morning as we uh, again fill ourselves with your word and understanding it and knowing you better for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So next week, we actually have Brian Davis, who's going to share with us. He's coming from Ireland. He was, um, here, let me read this because I I just forget. Um, Brian Davis. Brian Davis lives in County Clare, Ireland with his wife and kids. He is a pastor in North Clare Community Church. He currently runs an art school for kids and loves Jesus. He has also worked in animation as an artist. Now, this is why I'm bringing him the next. Prior to becoming a Christian, Brian was a Qigong master healer who ran schools for healing and also had spiritual workshops. Brian loves to share his story with anyone who is willing to listen. On the island, in our community, and and even here in in, uh, our church, we have a lot of people that have had very strong new age backgrounds or just coming out of it. And I really, uh, I've met um, Brian over the years in York, and I felt it would be really good to have him come and share with us on uh, next Sunday morning. So he will be here, and I hope that you have, if you have any friends that, you know, might be involved in it in any way. He's just going to tell his story. He's going to share the word. And I pray that it will be a real blessed time for us. The week after, we have uh, a young man. Well, he's sort of young. He's 40. But uh, he's, um, he was the assistant pastor here. Uh, he was a student. Then he was an intern. Then he became a uh, assistant pastor. And then he launched out and planted a church in New York City. And now he's pastoring in um, in New York. So he will be here teaching. But I wanted to do something, uh, a one-off here this morning. And I'm going to do something kind of strange because I never do this. But I, I never open my Bible at random. I always read through books of the Bible. And But the, the other day, I opened the Bible at random, and it fell to this passage. Now, this is a passage that, although I, f- I, I opened it at random, it's a passage that has been influential in my life over the years. God reminds me of this passage. But in a sense, what I want to do here today is kind of um, give, give you guys a sense of how I think when I get an impression from the Scriptures. 
How do I know that something is from God? Or how do I get strengthened in it? Or, or what, who is it talking to? And can I just apply that immediately to myself? Right? So I hope this helps. So I read that passage, and automatically I asked myself, okay, uh, who is it speaking to? Who is Zechariah? Who is um, who, the prophet? I mean, God is speaking to the prophet about uh, Zerubbabel. To, he's got to have a message for Zerubbabel. And who is Zerubbabel? Zerubbabel was the governor of Judea. Right? So, uh, and, and, and the next thing that we need to ask ourselves is, what's the context of what happened? Zerubbabel became the governor of Judea after Israel had been in captivity for 70 years in Babylon. They had been in Babylon as, uh, the, uh, as captives, and then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, now it's time to go back into the land. And you have to rebuild the temple, and you have to rebuild the walls, you have to rebuild the city. And so he was one of the influential people involved in the building, more specifically, of the temple. Remember, Nehemiah, to me, is a, a, a marvelous time in the history of, of Israel because you have Nehemiah building the wall. You have, um, uh, um, you have Ezra preparing himself to teach the word of God. You have Zerubbabel building the temple. You have Joshua, who is the priest. And you see an amazing teamwork being built in order to bring God's purposes forwards. But here, it's actually focusing on Zerubbabel. So when I read those verses, I have to ask myself, what circumstance is Zerubbabel under? I got, I think, nine things that Zerubbabel was going through. Yeah. That I'm, we're going to go through very quickly. Number one, Zerubbabel was commissioned to build a temple, but there was a lot of opposition. The surrounding peoples, including the Samaritans, who had moved into Israel after, Is after the Jews moved out, they had moved in, and they were giving the Jews a really hard time. They lobbied Persian authorities and caused trouble. The people of the land tried to discourage the Jews and troubled them in building and even wrote an accusation against the Jews. The accusation went something like this. If you let, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you let Israel build their nation again, they're going to be a kingdom and they're not going to pay taxes to us anymore. They are a bad nation. Number one, opposition from local authorities. Number two, discouragement among the people. They were returning from exile. They had economic difficulties. They had food shortages. They were discouraged. They had a long process of rebuilding Jerusalem and the temple, and it led to frustration. They were losing heart. This is seen in Ezra 4.24. Um, after these accusations, the opposition that we talked about which was actually in Ezra 4, 1 through 5, here in Ezra 4, 24, it says that the work of God stopped. They got so discouraged that the work of God stopped. And this is what I love about this. This, this section of the Bible is just amazing because, okay, so we're, we're in the book of Ezra, we're in the book of uh, Zechariah, we're in, but then Haggai shows up. And Haggai shows up actually in, 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 in Ezra. And that's why he says to the people, is it, it says, the people says the time has not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. So the discouragement had come in such a way to the Jews, building the temple, building the walls, that the people were saying to one another, the time hasn't come yet. Maybe it'll be in two years time. Maybe it'll be in four years' time. But Haggai says to them, this is in Haggai 1, 2 through 4, is it time for you to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? 
It's like, man, for, for your personal gain, the time is always. But for this building of the temple, the time has not yet come. And then he says these words to them. He says, he says this, you, you have sown much, but you bring in little. But you, 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 you eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages earns to put it into a bag with holes. And Haggai is just, you know, trying to get them to focus first on the kingdom of God. And then the Lord will take care of them. What they had done, it was exactly the opposite. But anyway, this is what Zerubbabel is dealing with. He's dealing with the discouraged people. Another challenge that Zerubbabel had was he was short of resources. He had to rebuild the temple and it required significant resources, labor, material, finances, due to the fact that they were in a, uh, in a, in a, in a room. I mean, they came from really captivity. It was hard to gather sufficient resources. It was a major challenge. There was political instability. Zerubbabel had to navigate very complex political dynamics with the Persians. Number five, there was a spiritual apathy. That's why Haggai and Zechariah were, were, were sent to them to rekindle Israel's fire. Not to get discouraged, actually to realize that God was doing a work, taking them back into the land. It was going to be hard work, but it was going to be God's work. And they had lost vision of that. They had spiritual apathy. But then another thing that was happening with them is that he also had to deal with another problem, Zerubbabel, is that when he laid the foundations of the new temple that they had built, it was, well, let me put it this way. There was people there, they were old. And they had seen Solomon's temple. And there were people there, they were young. And all they had ever seen was that temple. And the people that were young were just like, my goodness, look, we're building the temple. But the people that were old were like, it just doesn't look like the old temple. And they cried. They wept, and you couldn't hear, you couldn't hear that distinction between the cries of joy and the cries of sorrow. But Zerubbabel is having to deal with this, a comparison. As a matter of fact, Haggai even deals with it. Thank God there was the help of Haggai there. He says, who is left among you who saw the previous temple? And in Ezra chapter 3, 11 through 13, it says, many wept. Zerubbabel had to lead through this disappointment and help the people realize the importance of completing the temple. Number seven, there was a lack of focus. After the initial enthusiasm of returning to Jerusalem, the people became distracted with their own personal concerns, building their homes, establishing their farms, managing their affairs. Zerubbabel had to bring back focus. We need a place of worship. We need to build that which God has given us instructions on how to worship. Zerubbabel had to deal, deal with delays. External, I mean, we, so they sort of overlap a little bit, number eight. And uh, number nine, um, Zerubbabel had to deal, to, had to infuse into the people again to look at the promises of God. In what he was doing. My goodness, it's an overwhelming situation for Zerubbabel, to say the least. Just probably with a deep desire to quit. It was Abraham Lincoln that says, Sometimes I find myself on my knees praying to God for the sheer reason that I know of nowhere else to go. Just tired, overwhelmed. 
Bob Elrich last week. He wanted to take me cycling. I've never been cycling in my life. I don't know why I agreed to do it. <laughs> we picked up a bicycle in um, Port Sawyer, and all was good while well, it was flat. <laughs> Until we began to climb towards Deya and Valdemosa and Esporles. At one point, they went ahead. I was left alone, which I was happy about. <laughs> But then he, I had one guy kind of help me with the technique, which I had no clue about. And then he left. And then Bob comes back, and he's just behind me, almost breathing on my neck. Like, Bob, just leave me alone. Go. Meet me at the top. Just don't breathe on my neck. He's like, Raph, usually you're the boss. Today I'm the boss. I said, it's not about being boss or no boss. Just leave me alone right now. And he goes, are you enjoying the view? All I could see, all I could see was, all I could see was the, 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 the dirt. The, not the dirt, the, the asphalt. That's all I looked at. My legs hurt like never before. That's the hardest thing I've ever done. But it took everything within me not to quit. just to keep going forward. I did 50 kilometers. It's the last hill I just said, no, sorry. You, and I'll tell you which one it was because the whole thing was done. We were, we were cycling from Palma, yeah, he, he, from Palma to Soyer, and then you know you get to the tunnel. Well, in a car, you know what happens, right? In a car, you go right through the tunnel, not on a bicycle, no, no, no. On a bicycle, you have to climb over. And I said, sorry, I am not doing that hill. I'm just not doing that. Have your wife. And he said, I actually already arranged that my wife will pick you up. I said, great. And I got picked up after, fo after 49 kilometers. Not to exaggerate. But sometimes situations that we find ourselves in can seem overwhelming. And here, when we read these verses in chapter 4 of Zechariah, God tells Zechariah, I need you to speak to Zerubbabel because he's overwhelmed. Kind of like Paul said, above measure, beyond strength. And he says five things to him. This is what we're going to focus on. Five things, very quickly. Number one, he says to him, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. It is easy for us as believers to forget that. Paul has to remind the Corinthians of that. In the first three chapters, he has to say, hey, not many of you are wise. Not many of you are noble. God hasn't chosen you to serve him because of your, great, gr gr because of your greatness. Actually, God has chosen the foolish things of the earth to confound the wise. And it's God, God has chosen to enable unable people to do his work through, through his spirit. So he reminds the Corinthians. He reminds the Galatians. Are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Are you now going to try to finish in the flesh? And in 2 Chronicles 14, there was um, a King Asa who found himself. He had 580,000 troops and he found himself with a million man army, but not just a million man army that outnumbered his 580,000, but they actually also had the Egyptians. They had 300 chariots, which is like having three, uh, 300 A1s or, or, or Bradley's tanks. I mean, these things come in and they, they can do some damage. The odds were heavily against Esau, 
with Zerah's army, nearly twice the size of Judah's. But Asa sought the Lord, sought God's help, and through his prayer and reliance on God, Judah achieved the miraculous victory over the much larger Ethiopian, sorry, Ethiopian uh, force. These verses remind us that the work of God would not be accomplished through human resources, but by the Spirit of God. Relying on the Spirit of God. God has been faithful. You know, we, we came here, uh, Loretta and I were laughing because we had a four four uh, young people, they were in their 20s at our house uh, the other day, and they, they were asking for the story of this church. Well, Jean, pardon me when I say this, but um, she's, in the, she's out there. How old are you, Jean? No, you're not going to say, okay. But, but when, when I first became the pastor here, I remember Loretta and I, the, the youth group was 60 years and up. And at one point, literally, it was a bit of a joke, but it was a little bit of truth, you know, in it. We just kind of thought to ourselves, maybe God has just called us here to bury everybody and then move on. <laughs> it was a real older congregation. They were amazing saints. They were so supportive, just incredible. Gene being one of them. Andrew here being another one of them. But there were times in our lives that we just felt, what in the world are we doing here? But we always had a sense that God was doing a work. And oftentimes, in everything that we've accomplished in this church over the years, not to mention the conversions, because the other day we were in a meeting and I realized, man, about 80% of the people here uh, became Christians here. Not to mention, I mean, to become a Christian, that's a work of the Spirit of God. But Everything that we've experienced here over the years has not been because of our greatness. Everything has been because of His Spirit. And we must always be reminded of that so that we don't take the reins, but we let Him continue to have the reins of this church. That we would seek the wisdom of God. That we would seek even the, the pace of God. That we would not seek to sort of push it in one direction, but actually how we yield in His direction. And that when we are discouraged, that we are able to hear ourselves and, and, and that we are able to tell ourselves, you know, at the end of the day, this is not my work. It's the Spirit of God's work. That's the first thing that it reminds them of. Number two. The Lord also encourages Zerubbabel not to despise, to despise small beginnings. Every small step matters. So in, in Ezra 3, 10 through 13, they were, the, they were builders, the priests with trumpets, the Levites. And, and then they looked, at, they, they looked at the foundation and they saw it so little. The people shouted with a great shout and praised the Lord. But, but, but many wept. Many who had seen the previous temple saw this previous foundation, only the foundation, and it was all small. At the end, it was a small and unstable opposition from local enemies, discouraged people, short of resources, instability, spiritual apathy, comparison, lack of focus, all around, delayed. But I believe that God, through Zechariah is encouraging Zerubbabel not to despise the day of small beginnings because the history of Israel and the history of the church was always through small beginnings. At the end of the day, this great nation Israel, how did it get founded? Through one man and one woman called Abraham and Sarah. It was a small beginning. They were just meandered. They just sort of sojourned through the land. And then eventually it became the big nation of Israel. But then Jesus, how about Jesus? How about the small beginnings of Jesus being born in a stable? 
Don't despise the day of small things. What about when he moves to Nazareth and he works as a carpenter for years? Do not despise the day of small things. What about when he just grabbed two 12 disciples, very intelligent ones. I mean, he, brought, he got the best of the best. I mean, he, they, they weren't all, all that. He grabbed 12 guys that he was going to use and he just met with them. But those small beginnings were the beginning of the church of Jesus Christ. With those 12, even the interruptions, he was never too big in the big policies to ignore the immediate needs that were coming to him. Hey, will you help my daughter? Hey, will you help my son? Hey, will you, will you, I want to see, willing to be interrupted, just, just involved. He didn't think about the big thing. I'm in the White House. I legislate. No, no. He was a people, people, individually with people. And now he's in heaven building his church. Every small step matters. And the temptation is to despise, to look down on the small things that God has put before us. Don't get discouraged. God has never despised small beginnings Number three, so we have, we have a, a, a work of the Spirit. It's, it's going to be Him that does it. It's, uh, it's the small beginnings. But God also reminds them, He says in verse 7, He says, Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain. And He shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. And this really... This really spoke to me because, I mean, here they're seeing a destroyed city, a destroyed mountain, uh, Temple Mount. They see all the rubble. And my goodness, they have to work through that. And that work seemed like just a huge mountain, impossible to achieve. And God wants to remind Zerubbabel that that great mountain will one day become a plain. But the way, the attitude of the heart had to, and, and, and even the attitude of God's heart towards him was going to be grace upon grace. I think sometimes when we really want a work of God to happen, the thing that we can become is drivers rather than leaders. And here, what, he, what, what he's saying is, Zerubbabel, that mountain, that overwhelmingness that you see, that, that, that huge thing, you don't worry. I am sovereign. I'm going to make it into a plane. But I want you to know that the spirit of this is grace. Grace upon grace. There was opposition. It was a huge work. But listen, guys, the work of God is unstoppable. And the work of God is also full of grace. I think of, I, when, the moment I thought about grace and unstoppable, I thought of the book of Acts. Jesus begins his church. The gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. And he begins to choose men and women. I'm going to mention four guys, but he begins to choose men and women. And you see Stephen saying, you stiff-necked people. But his face shone like an angel and he shares the love of God with the people. John. John, who wanted to call fire upon Samaria. Next thing you know, he's calling the spirit of God upon Samaria. Grace rather than judgment. Peter, after being restored, after denying the Lord, he writes to the shepherds and he says, I want you to not lord over the people, but that you would serve the people, not because you have to, but because you get to. Grace. And Paul, what can we say about Paul? 
every epistle, grace and peace and, and, uh, to you. Every time he writes a letter, it, even with the hardest things he has to say, they're always dominated by grace. But listen to this. It is a gracious work but it is a persistent work. Listen, Acts 2.41, then those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. 2.47, praising God and enjoying favor of all the people and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. 4.4, but many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew about 5,000. 5.14 of Acts. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. 6-7. So the word of the Lord spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. 9.31. And the church throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit and it increased in numbers. And here you have an unstoppable work of the Spirit of God but being done in a spirit of grace. And God reminds Zerubbabel I'm going to make this mountain a plain, but it's going to be through shouts of grace. Number four. Juanita, where are you? Juanita shared about how she felt in this microbiology team, just like whether she can, she's there. She, she comes to Mallorca from South Africa to serve on this team, and she feels like, man, I've begun, but can I really finish? Have you ever felt like that? I mean, on my cycle, I was like, can I really finish this thing? I mean, this is, this is just crazy. It's easy to begin certain things, but to actually finish Or sometimes you can feel like, oh man, I'm not going to finish just because I'm not worthy to finish. And I wonder if Zerubbabel was feeling the fatigue, but maybe also the, the sort of the imposter syndrome that Juanita was talking about. Look at verse 4, 9. God reminds Zerubbabel, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands shall also finish it. Zerubbabel is hearing, you're going to finish it, Zerubbabel. And he's looking to the sides. No, why, maybe, maybe, they, no, no, you are going to finish it. What, what? No, no, you are going to finish it. Sometimes we think of starting, but feel we cannot finish. And Zerubbabel gets encouraged and say, no, you laid the foundation. You're going to carry this whole project to the end. And number five. It might seem, so for them, it might, the work seems smaller. This this one blows my mind. It says, Haggai 2.9 says, I mean, they laid the foundation and and the old people were like, oh, this is smaller than Solomon's temple. They're comparing and, 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 and God wants to remind them it might be smaller but it's going to be better. In Haggai 2.9, it says, The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Haggai 2.3, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now in comparison? Is it not to your eyes as nothing? But you don't worry. The latter temple will be greater than this one. And I thought to myself, how does that work out? Well, it's interesting. It works out literally on the temple. Because although that temple was smaller, Herod came and actually made it bigger later than Solomon's temple. But I don't think that's the actual interpretation. That might be a practical thing that sort of is thrown in there by God to say, you want a bigger temple? I'll give you a bigger building. But I believe that it goes much, much further than that, as I'm, going to, as I'm going to explain to you now. 
four quick applications to this. What we just heard, four quick applications. Number one, what does it not mean? It does not mean that you get ideas in your heart of what you want to do, and then you read Zerubbabel, and you're like, oh my goodness, I claim this for myself, and Lord bless everything I do always. It does not mean that. I mean, I could, I could take any project in my life and say, hey, this, I want to apply these principles to me. It does not mean that. doesn't mean this doesn't apply to us personally, but initially it doesn't, it doesn't apply to us. The direct interpretation and application is that God was doing a great work that they didn't realize. Building the temple. Herod bettered the temple and made it bigger. But listen, guys. Jesus came. What made the temple better was not Herod expanding it. What made the temple better is that Jesus stepped into it. God incarnate. Listen, the greater temple that Herod expanded, you know what it lacked? The Ark of the Covenant was not there. But Jesus was. Jesus came. And that temple became better because God himself walked into it. God with man. God in the temple. And then Jesus begins his church. Jesus begins his church, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit. This building is not the temple. You are the temple. I am the temple. Jesus begins the church by his spirit, not despising the day of small things. As a matter of fact, the Zerubbabel, the, it, the immediate application, the immediate interpretation goes to Zerubbabel, but the extended application goes to Jesus. Do you remember when Jesus walked with the two on the road to Emmaus? He explained everything concerning himself. He is the Zerubbabel building the temple. And not only is he building the church here on earth, not despising the day of small things, but in Revelation it says, but I saw no temple in heaven for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine for the glory of God was its glory. For the glory, sorry, the glory of God was its light and its temple's light. So the immediate application we see is that, you know, it would be easy for me to uh, apply it like this. I'm Zerubbabel, guys. And I'm overwhelmed with everything that's going on and you guys are here to serve me and my Zerubbabel. But no, no, that's not the key. The key is Jesus is the bigger Zerubbabel. He's building and we are together serving him. Now, does that mean that we cannot apply that to our local church? Absolutely not. We can apply it to our local church. Our local church is part of the greater work of what Jesus is doing. Jesus is building his church. So in a sense, we are also a part of this. And this can be an encouragement for us. Whatever it is that we do in this church, that it will be by the Spirit of God, that we will not despise the day of small things, that we will be uh, strong in grace, that we will be strong in God's ability and not our ability that we would finish the things that God puts before us and that we might, although we might compare to other things we were experienced in the past, that we realize that God is leading us in the present. And then the fourth application, which I think is very important as well, is the beautiful application that, yes, it can also be applied to us in our endeavors as we commit our ways to the Lord in our business. 
Do you see what I mean? Whether you might have in, in things that God has put on your heart. I mean, take, for example, um, Steffi with real love, and she's endeavoring in this. Or take us with the school, and, and we're endeavoring in this. Or, or whatever things that God has put into your, into your life, that he's put desires upon your heart, and you feel the burden you feel like you have to produce the strength. You feel like um, you, got, you have to push forward or you cannot get rid of the mountain. It is then that we're able to say, my goodness, God strengthens Zerubbabel. God can strengthen me. Does that make sense? And I say that because immediately when we read our Bibles, what we do is we read our Bibles and we're like, I'm Zerubbabel. And it's much more varied than that. And there's an immediate interpretation and application. We need, that is the, that is the unstoppable one. That is what's truly going to strengthen our heart. God's work is unstoppable and God's work is his church. The things that I venture in, sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Have you made mistakes before? Have you ever thought God led you into something and then it wasn't? And we need to leave that open to be able to say, Lord, I don't want to do what I want to do. I want to do what you want me to do. So I was greatly encouraged by this passage. Particularly in the light of church and in the light of the school. without neglecting what God is doing throughout the world. But I was encouraged to be able to say, man, if God has called us to this, it's not going to be by might. It's not going to be by power. His spirit is leading us. And we had a meeting the other day, and it was amazing to see the diverse people in the meeting. Just how the, the God was putting something together. That sometimes we might be overwhelmed with life. We can apply that like that to our life. And that those mountains, God is faithful to make plains. That God's heart towards us is grace upon grace. That we would not despise, that we would not just be people that look for the big things we can do, but that we would be people that are faithful in the little things that God puts before us. And that we would not be people that are comparing But we realize sometimes that sometimes smaller might be better. (laughs) And that God has a plan that it might not seem so impressive to us on the outside because I'm sure that people at the temple when Jesus stepped in, they just kind of thought it was just another Jew in there. Not aware that God himself had stepped in. (laughs) And we need to have eyes to see the beauty of what God is doing among us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord. We love, we love your word, Lord. We want to be able to handle it uh, well. We want to understand it in its context and be able to uh, benefit from its applications to our life. And I'm so thankful, Lord, to know that it doesn't depend just on us. That you are with us by your Spirit, through your grace, in the, in the beginning steps. We're just so, so grateful, Lord. And we want to be strengthened by you. We want to realize, Lord, that not only do you want to fill us collectively with your spirit, but you want us individually to rely upon your spirit in our community with one another. Thank you, Lord, that we get to be a part of what you are doing on earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.